What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Life Podcast. Um, your host Tyron Johnson, and today we got a special guest, Christina King. I said I said your name correctly, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Christina King. Um, I never met her in real life before. I was following her on Instagram. You know, I love to see scores, and she was. <laughs> y'all know my love for women's basketball, so. She's the first woman professional athlete that I've had on the podcast. And I'm always giving you guys a bunch of males perspective. I wanted to get her perspective because I see she's been doing it and doing it for a while and successfully doing it at the same time. So, Christina, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. you. Give us a brief like, introduction of who you are so we can get familiar and we can rock on after that. Awesome. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. I'm very appreciative and I, I love the what you're doing. And um, just thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to you know, share my story, share my journey. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Right, um, so where you, uh, you're from Georgia, right? Yeah, sort of. So I was born in Washington State. So I like initially grew up on the West Coast and then kind of bounced back between um, Georgia and Washington. And then did two years of high school in, in Washington State and then two years of high school in Georgia. And that's where I finished up before I went on to um, Richmond for four years. I got you in Richmond. My gosh, from Richmond. I always, I always supposed to go to Richmond, but I never had time. Uh, okay. I supposed to be on the podcast last week. You know Chris Copeland? Uh, yeah, yeah. Isn't he out in like Thailand right now? No, nah, he retired. He was with the Pacers and he just uh, retired. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I feel like um, I follow him on... Uh, on social media to be honest okay okay so let's, let's um now you're playing you're currently playing in uh which country uh i'm currently in sweden it's my eighth year pro 10th country i've played in so far 10, ten countries and you're yeah in sweden um i like sweden it's cold it's cold in sweden it is <laughs> so cold it was literally like and this is the thing about sweden it'll be cold one minute and snowing and then the next it'll be sunny and like in you know a long sleeve and in pants and i'm like it literally was just snowing outside like what is happening so the weather is constantly changing but yeah it's cold it's cold on a whole new level here well let's get back to um in, in high school you switch high schools and i know that's a tough transition for a lot of people i went yeah. to high school like 30 minutes away from me but i was running away from getting beat up so <laughs> <laughs> but it was difficult because I had to have new friends. People didn't respect me. And that's actually kind of how I got cut the first two seasons of okay. high school because I just was a, you, when you're not popular in high school, you're just not doing it. In high school, were you like a, a big time talent at the school or were you like, you kind of got it out of the mud and made a name for yourself? So what was the situation like? Yeah. So growing up, um, I was in one of the hubs of like Washington state for basketball. Um, I was in Spokane, which I don't know if you're familiar with like Gonzaga, uh, John Stockton, like I played with his daughter and stuff growing up. And so, um, the first couple years, like I was one of three freshmen coming into my high school that were like supposed to be, you know, the next stars. Right. And so, um, like they had been priming me. I'd been playing on our like varsity team since eighth grade. We did the summer leagues with our high school varsity team as eighth graders. And then, uh, coming in, you know, they had us on like weight training programs and everything to get us, you know, bulked up because the conference we were in, we were playing against, you know, now WNBA players like Courtney Vandersloot, um, Angie Bjorklund, uh, she's out in like high level Europe and stuff. So, uh, you know, growing up, we did kind of already have sort of a name for ourselves and it's a small city in Spokane. So, you know, basketball is like our thing. Um, so transitioning from, you know, the West coast style of play and like having a name out there to being a newcomer in the South was tough. Um, but you know, I, I was lucky to play on, um, a couple of like Nike sponsored uh, AAU teams in Georgia. My dad got me hooked up with that, like immediately when I got there. So I was able to start, you know, and, and get my name out there a lot quicker. Um, but it, it is kind of stressful because, you know, going into your junior season, that's when like you start to really feel college offers and like kind of figure out where you want to go. And so to transition, go completely to the other side of the country, I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to, you know, continue and, and be on their radars anymore. But it actually was the best thing for me because I was able to kind of get the West Coast style of play and the East Coast style of play and get fielded from both sides of the country when it came to colleges. 
I understand. That's something I try to I'd latch on to is because I'm from the deep south and mm. I do my camps in Idaho and Wyoming and I hoop in California and yeah. in Miami all the time. And I see it's different styles and different so mentalities different. in each coast. And I know a lot of yeah. guys from uh, Washington, they're just real heady, real like um, Will Conroy. Uh, I know that whole little clip of Will Conroy, Brandon Roy, and them. They're real, all of them are like really heady basketball <laughs> players. And um, I can see it in your game a lot. Like when I look at you, if I was to diagnose you as a type player, I would say you were a scorer. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're a point guard or a shooting guard, but I see you put the ball in the bucket. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> um, just for me, in my opinion, I know I get a lot of flack for this, but I always say that if guys want to get better at basketball, they should watch women because you guys play the game the right way, in my opinion, because we tend to rely on our athleticism a lot. True, true. (laughs) You guys' skill level is like, when you really looking at the game, it's on another level. Talk to me about the difference between, I don't know if you play against men in the summer or whatever sometimes, but tell me the difference between, especially in Europe, playing um, women's basketball compared to men's basketball. Like, do you yeah. guys notice the difference? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, like for, for me growing up, I always played against the guys. Like in the summer times, you know, when you're back at home playing pickup or whatnot, you always like, it's rare to find a good run with just females. So you typically have to kind of transition over and play with the guys. And then in a lot of um, different like European countries I've played in, we had like a guys um, team that we would go against, you know, in like practices and whatnot. Um, And then even in college, like our practice team um, or our practice players for like scrimmaging, getting ready for games was against the club guys team. So like I've been playing against guys, you know, my whole life. And um, and it's a difference in the sense of like the pace of the game, like against, you know, females, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit more, you know, fundamentally like skill, you know, run your plays, run your sets. But against guys, it's like, hey, who has the ISO? Who has, you know, the mismatch or whatnot? Okay, let's get them on a situation. Let's get them in pick and rolls. And then the pace of the game is like, you know, you get the rebound, two passes, you're already down the court trying to score. So it's a little bit different in the pace and getting used to that. But then it's always fun transitioning from, you know, playing against guys to playing against women again because you're like you start to see the game it slows down for you after you've been playing against guys and it's so much faster the game starts to slow down so you're able to pick things apart and like pick up on things a lot quicker so I've I've loved that kind of uh experience right it's the same with, with, with guys it's like um whatever level you play at the higher level you go at like when I was in uh the preseason with the Pacers guys was asking me like yo what's was the difference playing in the NBA compared to playing in Europe I was like the game is like this it didn't Mm -hmm. it didn't slow down for me because I guess I wasn't used to the level but whenever I tried to tell them as soon as the game slowed down that's when you really that's when your training comes in oh absolutely (laughs) absolutely and that was like uh because I had a, a workout with the Atlanta Dream and so I was like you know super excited and a little nervous and whatnot and it was a one-on-one workout, you know, Michael Cooper was there and everything. And I was getting led through it with their trainers and it was an hour long workout. And I literally felt like I had been playing for three hours just because it was like drill, 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 do this, do this, do this quick water break. Okay. Come back. Now we're doing this drill. And it was just, the pace was so much quicker. So yeah, it's definitely a, a different level. <laughs> so I seen, um, at Richmond, you pretty much started all your games from the junior senior year. See, I remember stuff off my head. <laughs> you, you played all four years, but, um, what was that um, when you came in, you was a freshman, sophomore, it seemed like they used you sparingly. And then your junior and senior year, that's when you got into the Thousand, the thousand Club. <laughs> you know, yeah. What was your college experience like um, coming out at, at Richmond? Yeah. Um, I mean, mine was a little tough. Uh, coming in as a freshman, you know, we were, um, I was one of three that were expected to play a lot, actually. And uh, coming in, you know, I had a good preseason. I actually ended up starting the first couple of games because our starting point guard, who was a senior redshirt senior, um, got hurt. So I started to play, you know, the first couple of games. And then right before uh, we started conference play, I actually had a season ending knee injury. So I ended up having to get surgery. It was my first time ever dealing with like a major, major injury. So, you know, dealing with that mental aspect and like, you know, of course the physical comeback, but it's more, more so the mental side of things. Mm -hmm. That's like the toughest part of coming back from injuries. And so, um, 
it wasn't an ACL either, which was nice too, because I broke a piece of bone. So I basically had to wait for the bone to like heal. So I wasn't worried necessarily about like the whole, is my ligament going to heal up? Is it going to be the same? It was more just like, you know, it takes time to, to let it fuse together. So, um, that was the positive side of it, but coming in as a sophomore, I had seen, you know, been on the sidelines, seen what coach wanted and everything as a freshman. So coming in as a sophomore, I was way in my head about like, okay, I need to make sure every detail is right because I, I saw it my freshman year. So I'm like on the side of like breaking things down. And then I started overthinking. And so really like the off season after my sophomore year going into my junior year, I was working out and like having individuals with the coaches every day. Um, and basically like gearing myself up to just be back in that mindset of just play, like just let your instincts take over and just like trust yourself. And so then coming in as a junior was my breakout year. And that was when, you know, I was like the leading scorer of the team, um, getting a lot of minutes, one of the prominent like uh, pieces to our um, success. And we actually ended up, we almost got an at-large bid to the tournament that year, but we lost in like the first round of the A-10 tournament. So that kind of knocked us out. But, um, but yeah, and then came back as a senior and my coach was hard on me because he knew I wanted to play at the next level. He knew I wanted to, you know, be a pro overseas. And so he was on me hard and he had to kind of make it an example for our freshmen coming in. And so it was like, you know, he was on me every single day, every single day, but like going through that process and knowing what I know now, like I'm so appreciative of it because it's like a lot of times and, and I might get a lot of flack for saying this, but like, it seems like nowadays everybody is so worried about like saying the wrong things as far as when it comes to like player development and stuff. And like you get, you know, I went back to visit and he was like, I can't even yell at our girls or else they'll go to the, um, the like board or whatnot and like try to get me fired. And I was like, are you serious right now? Like coaches have to yell at their players to like get them to understand and like bring out the best in them. Like I don't do well being coddled. I need somebody sometimes to like jump my behind and be like, are you going to come on or what? So, you know, that part has been kind of interesting and I've seen it kind of change the game a lot more because we were developing a culture of like being coddled and kind of being babies when it comes to like wanting to compete. So that part was kind of different. And I mean, especially when you're talking about, you know, being a pro overseas and you can relate to this too, you're literally leaving everything that's comfortable. You're leaving your family, your friends, your support system, everything. And you have to be all of that and more for yourself in a different country where you don't speak the same language. Your teammates, sometimes, you know, you get along with them. Sometimes they're like, oh, you're the newcomer coming in. I got to prove myself so I don't lose my time. So it's like a lot of different factors that play into being an athlete overseas and like the mental capacity to be able to handle that, not just for a game, not just for a month, but for seven to eight months out the year. And consistently perform at a high level like if I didn't go through what I went through in college I probably wouldn't have made it you know as an overseas athlete because it's a lot more mentally tough than it is like playing in the states man I I never I mean I get to see the ultra sensitive society I get flagged for it all the time (laughs) so I don't care yeah Um, but I never thought it would trickle down into the game like that I I never even fathomed that you know they can get a lot of accusations. They really yep. have to watch what they say, watch what they touch, watch yep. what they look. We're literally living in a society now where it's like everybody gets a trophy, even if you win, lose, or whatnot. And it's like we used to compete. Like everybody wants to be friends now, which is not, you know, off the court, that's fine. Like be friends or whatnot. But when it comes time to like step in between those lines, it's like it's a war. Right. So you got to be on my level or else you're not going to last long out here. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm- I'm not, I'm, I always said, man, they always called me grandpa since I was like 12. I got like an old soul. So it's like, I'm cool with almost everybody in France, but whenever it's time to play, bro, I don't know you. Exactly. <laughs> like, we're not friends. Like you're my competitor. Like I'm competing against you because I want to win. So, so what's, so um, this is a big question I have, you know, me playing overseas for so long. I get asked the question all the time, but I never really had the experience because when I came out of college, uh, opportunities were just presented to me. I didn't know that overseas even existed. It was NBA mm-hmm. or the hood for me. Or nothing, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the fact that you knew that you wanted to be a pro overseas or WNBA, that was, how is it if, let's just imagine I'm this kid in Louisiana. I just finished four years in college. What's the next step? Yeah. The plan overseas. Yeah. I mean, for me, I kind of went, I had like an interesting path because, you know, 
after we don't have any resources or like guys. So that's why it's so important that like us as professional athletes now and like being veterans in the game, like it's so important for us to give back and like help kind of groom that next generation because when I was coming out, I had no idea, you know, you go to high school and then you're prepped to like figure out how to get to college and what college you want to go to. But after that, there's so many routes you can take to get to overseas. So for me, you know, I didn't know how like agents reaching out on social media and stuff. I was like, oh, that's got to be a scam. Like, (laughs) why would they reach out to me via, you know, Facebook or, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I was like expecting, you know, an email or like, you know, my coach to, you know, get fielded by stuff. So that was a whole different process in and of itself. But, um, and I actually ended up losing a couple of like good agents in the process just because I, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was like, oh, well, let me, you know, talk to my family. Let me talk to my coaches. They're like, we have literally a list of 10 other players that we're fielding right now. And by the time you get back to us, we're going to already have them, you know, ready, signed with us and, and looking at countries. So we're good. You you continue in that search, you know. So I ended up losing out on a couple of good ages because I just didn't know any better. So I actually ended up, um, I was at IMG Academy down in Florida uh, Mm -hmm. training and I was doing an internship down there and got linked up with a couple of overseas professional athletes that kind of like helped groom me on on the process and, you know, looking for an agent, how to vet them and everything like that. And so I started reaching out to teams on my own. I had my own highlight tape um, that I created. I started like looking at Eurobasket, figuring out, okay, like these are kind of the leagues that fit my kind of game I'm looking at the people that they're signing and understanding like okay you were in my conference we kind of had the same game so like let me look at the countries that you've signed to and and start to like you know reach out to teams reach out to coaches reach out to general managers um and kind of field it for myself and I actually got linked up with um, a coach out in Germany who knew one of my assistant coaches at Richmond and so he was like hey you know like I actually knew your coach whatnot so like um and I was a part of the team that, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but in Richmond, we had um, a hot air balloon accident and it killed our director of basketball operations and my assistant coach that actually like recruited me. And so he knew one of the coaches that was in that accident. So he was like, you know, like out of respect for her and everything she's done and whatnot, like I'll totally help you. And so um, he introduced me to my first agent uh, and literally I signed with him. Um, and that was towards the end of July. And a week later, I was, he was calling me, Hey, you need to, um, get your stuff ready, pack your bags. You're going to Romania. And I was like, okay, that was quick. So literally within like a span of like two week turnaround, I was packing my bags and getting ready to go to Romania. Um, but it is tough in that first kind of steps because you don't know what you're doing. And then it's like this waiting game, you know, you sign with an agent, you're just like, okay, I'm going to train and, and hopefully something comes through the door, but I don't know what's next. And so it's a lot of waiting and, and anxiety that comes through with that. But, you know, now that I'm a vet, I'm like, it's just a part of the process. So they were reaching out to you or you were like searching, looking for agents? Um, so I had agents reach out to me at first, but I like blew it because I didn't know what I was doing. And so then towards the, um, like I would say mid June and July was when I started reaching out to teams personally, um, through Eurobasket and whatnot. And then I got linked up with an agent and signed with him. And then he started working for me. Okay. I got you. I got yeah. You. I understand. All right. So, um, now you're a pro, you know, mm-hmm. you've been in 10 different countries. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What's been the most difficult adjustment, I would say, for you as a pro in these 10 years? I would say probably, like, there's a couple of different things. There's, like, adjusting to the culture and whatnot. Um, and, like, when I played in France, for example, love French, love the culture and everything like that. And thankfully, I took it in college or else I would have been struggling because nobody on my team spoke English. Like my head coach didn't speak English. My assistant coach spoke, you know, a a decent amount, but we'd be in timeouts in the middle of the games and he's yelling at me in French and like, or trying to call out a play and stuff. And I'm looking like, I got dribble, I got pass and I got the number of the play we're supposed to run right now because they didn't speak English like that. So that was tough, like adjusting, but basketball is kind of a universal language. So you kind of can just pick up on like body language and whatnot to figure out what you're supposed to do. Right. But um, overall adjustment just from going from college to the pros, I would say like understanding that you are your own support system. You're responsible for everything. You know, you don't 
in college, you know, you have your family that comes to the games and then your, your team kind of is like a sisterhood, so to speak. Like you have, you know, day in, day out for four years straight, you're around roughly the same, you know, give or take kind of group of people. Whereas once you get to a pro, it's like, you're on your own. This is business now. And understanding that like you're paid to perform. If you don't perform, you're out the door. They'll cut you in a second. So understanding that kind of, um, like ment- having that mentality and having to kind of develop that like killer instinct, like you're either going to, you know, help us win or you're on the next flight out. Like that was kind of the biggest adjustment. Cause in college, you know, you have that team, you have that camaraderie, everybody kind of knows their role, knows what's expected of them. But overseas, it's like, you have to be everything and more. You have to be a rebounder, uh, a ball handler, a scorer. You have to then help the other players on the team like rise up and, and get to a whole new level and create for them. So you kind of become this all-encompassing player and doing that day in, day out for seven to eight months at a time. Like It's tough when you don't have that support system that you're used to back home. Right. And then, I don't know. I mean, I played, I played in like eight countries myself, but it's like, if you go to France first, I've been here for seven years now, and mm-hmm. you basically have to lose everything you think of a human, whatever you think a human being is, whatever emotions you have, whatever type of, pa- anything you think, you got to forget it. Mm-hmm. Because if you're too passionate, then they'll call you crazy. If you're not <laughs> passionate enough, they'll think something's wrong with you. True. So it's, it's like, it's a very difficult culture to adjust to, but. It's cool, but it's, I still don't understand I'm seven years in. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And like, uh, you know, the European culture in general, like I've come across a lot of teammates and they're like, you take basketball way too seriously. And I'm like, well, it's my job. Like I'm paid to be here. Like that's what they are bringing me in to do. So of course I'm going to take it. Yeah, exactly. Like, of course I'm going to take it seriously. Like, you know, and I mean, it's a little different situation for me now because I have a full time. I'm job back in the States that I do while playing. But, you know, before it was like, you guys go to your job during the day and then come to basketball practice. Whereas I'm up, you know, going to lift and doing this and going to extra shooting and then going to practice. And that's like my day revolves around me being an athlete. So it's a little different kind of responsibility for me. And it's going to show in the games when I'm the one expected to, you know, perform and help us win versus you who is like, if we can get anything from you, you know, that's positive. So right. yeah, it's, it's definitely a different kind of mindset you have to develop. What's been your favorite country so far? Depends on what you're asking for. Like, as far as the game. As far as okay, playing. the game. Letting you, playing, be, letting you be Christina. I would probably say either Taiwan or Germany. Um, Taiwan <laughs> was, I mean, the Asians, like the Asian community and culture loves that they go crazy for it so it's like you're literally in the stands and like the stands are packed like after games and stuff you have fans coming up trying to interview you and everything like the the whole atmosphere yes like the atmosphere is amazing in in the asian uh country so playing in taiwan was absolutely amazing um we were in an olympic uh qualifying event so we were playing against you know japan korea um and then they had like australia new zealand in there as well but uh, the level was so high too, because you're playing against their like national teams and they're prepping to go to the Olympics. So the, the competition was absolutely amazing and like just so tough and competitive. And then after the games, you know, you're, you're staying at the same hotel, you're eating together, you get to like meet people from all different, you know, walks of life, different journeys and stuff. So it was, it was the coolest experience. Yeah. I tell, I played in Japan and I was like, yo, this is the closest thing to the NBA I've experienced. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a whole new level. Yeah, and there was and then, there was a lot more understanding that I'm American. So when they when we was in groups, they tried to speak English. Exactly. But whenever they was amongst themselves, they spoke Japanese. But whenever I was yeah. around, they tried to involve me in a conversation. Yeah, been friends yeah, seven years. They're not involving you in anything. <laughs> nope, nope. France, Germany. It's like you're gonna adapt to our culture and pick up on what we're saying. And I'm like, yeah, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah. And yeah. then in Germany, it was great. Cause, uh, like my coach, he just let me be me. So I like transitioned from like in high school and stuff, I played point guard a lot. Um, and it was great. Cause I was like able to be coached by like John Stockton and whatnot. So I got like a different kind of feel for the game at that position. Um, uh, but then because I'm taller for my, um, uh, you know, for the female athlete, um, yeah. I moved to like a 
two, three, and sometimes even college, I was playing like a, a four, um, being like, you know, we do a four out one in or a five out kind of offense. And, you know, we're moving around and stuff. And like inside, if you have the, the mismatch, um, and then you get overseas and it's like, you're, you're like a four, aren't you? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm really kind of a point guard, but you know, you kind of have to adjust to what the team has sometimes. And like having that flexibility to play multiple positions just kind of keeps you on the court longer. Yes, you but in, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cause it's like, Oh, they can pull out, you know, whoever, if they're not playing well or, you know, need a break or whatnot, you can just move to that position because you're, you're multifaceted. Um, but in Germany, I got to, to play point guard and kind of got to like run the team and have the ball in my hands and make a lot of the decisions, which is what I love to do. Um, and that's when I had like some of my best years. I mean, I won like back-to-back MVP there, uh, and was leading the league in scoring and assists. So like it, it was just a really good experience. And I kind of just felt free. Yeah, I like that, man. I like that. That's why I like the Asia because I, I played a four here in France, but it's like, mm-hmm. I've never played a four really in my life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know who told y'all I'm a four, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know None of my film kind of showcased that, but. Yeah, we can so make I, it work. Yeah, I do it because you get paid for the price of two people. I, I exactly. Kinda like that. But um, I'm going to ask two more questions that just far as like, uh, before I get to the other part of it, because, you know, you know, you got things to do. <laughs> um, how is it dealing with being, how does family come visit you? The, do you ever get to see friends and family or do you only see them in the summer whenever you have a break? So that's kind of interesting. Um, my first year pro, my stepmom actually came out to Romania and visited me for about a week. And that was awesome. Um, and then my third year playing, my dad was able to come out to Switzerland and visit me out there. Um, and then let's see, my mom came out to France a couple of years ago and was able to visit me. And then my best friend came and spent New Year's with me in, uh, we were in Paris and Amsterdam. So like I've gotten a little bit over the years and stuff, but um, it's kind of cool because playing overseas, like the the Americans, we kind of tend to like come together and kind of look out for each other and stuff, both on the men and women's side. So I've developed a lot of like friendships with other hoopers that are playing overseas. So you kind of just develop this like new, new family away from, you know, your family back home. So we try to link up and whatnot and get together. Like if we're in close countries or if we're playing in the same country, we try to link up and just see each other and kind of have that like taste of home while we're, you know, away. But as far as my family back home, like it's been kind of tough just because it's a lot to ask for them to like make that trip and stay for a few days and, you know, get off work and take that vacation and stuff. Um, but they've been, I've been blessed to have, you know, some of them come out and visit. And then, uh, you know, when I go home in the summers, it's usually me jumping around from place to place, trying to see everybody while I'm home. All right. So, um, how is it, um, dating? <laughs> like it, how that got, that's one of the biggest questions I get. How do you date overseas? And I've never heard a woman's perspective because the men's perspective it's kind of toxic, I get. <laughs> so I would really love to hear a woman's perspective. How do you date by being a professional athlete in yeah. the world? Um, so let's see. Uh, my first couple of years, I was actually with a guy I was dating in college. So like, you know, we, we made it work long distance. Um, but then now, you know, I've been with the same guy for like four or five years now. Um, and he hoops too. So it's like, it's a different kind of aspect too, because it's like, when you're an athlete and you're overseas and there's already stress you got to deal with, you got to deal with, you know, the stress of being away from everything, you know, you got to deal with the stress of like performing at a high level. So if somebody hasn't like really gone through it and understood, like, you know, you're away from everything that's comfortable for you and like the demands of, of being a high level athlete, if they haven't gone through it themselves, it's hard to kind of connect on that level because it's like, you know, they're like, Oh, why haven't you called me or whatnot? Like, or, you know, we haven't talked a lot on the phone. You know, I miss you. And I was like, I miss you too, but I am exhausted. I literally just spent the whole day in the gym. You know, we just had a game or, you know, it was a good game or even worse after bad games. Cause you're upset and don't really want to talk about it. And then it's like, you know, you want to sit up and talk and, and be in love. And I'm like, I'm, I need to go to sleep. Cause I got to yeah. wake up in the morning and do this all over again. So you know, the guy I'm with now, like, uh, we've been together five years. He played overseas, uh, played in like, you know, 13 countries. And so like, he's been all around the world. And so we kind of have that like understanding of knowing what it's like playing at a high level and like the demands and stuff. So it's so easy to like make it work. Cause it's like, you've been where I've been at, like, you understand the game, you understand, you know, what it is. So if I'm like, Hey, like, 
I don't have enough to give tonight. Like I'm tired. And, oh yeah, go to bed. We'll talk tomorrow. So um, I've been in a relationship most of my years of playing. So I haven't necessarily like, I might not be the best person to ask for that, but um, it is tough because a lot of it is long distance and dealing with like, you know, the fact that you can't really see them like on an everyday basis or whatnot. Like it's tough. I got you. Um, so you said that you got a full-time job outside of basketball. People think that I'm crazy. They see my story. I guess they see, I don't, I, I have a humble issue. So <laughs> sometimes I'm too humble. I guess they see my success and they're like, they wouldn't believe that I got like six or seven businesses that takes up all of my time. All of it. So, <laughs> so it's like, I mean, I get up pretty much at six in the morning and I go to bed at like 11 at night, but from six to 11, something is is done. And I mm-hmm. creep out some time for my girl. That's why you gotta have a strong partner because you met me this way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you wanna like, you know, have all the benefits of uh, like, you know, living a certain type of lifestyle and whatnot. And it's like, you can't, you know, I always get, I always laugh at, especially for the, for the female community, it's like, oh yeah, I want my man to, you know, like do this and do this and whatnot. And it's like, okay, great. Like, that's awesome. But are you going to, you know, respect that when he's like, I got to stay up late working. I don't have time for us right now. Like there it's, it's gotta be a balance, you know, you can't expect that. And then, you know, be like, oh yeah, but you don't have enough time for me. It's like, well, you want to enjoy these finer things. Like this is the sacrifice you sometimes have to make. So you got to have that strong partner. Right. It's because, I mean, a lot of dudes look at me and I guess they will see, okay, well, you one of the top players, you get paid six figures, whatever, and they figure like that's enough. And I'm like, bro, we don't have no retirement, no pension. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like I have to do as much as I can to make sure that I'm set up for life after yep. I'm done. So what yep. is it that you do full time um outside of basketball? Yeah. So, um, I'm a digital marketing consultant. So, and then I work, you know, more specifically as an SEO consultant, so search engine optimization. So anything dealing with like your website, um, and getting it to perform higher in Google search results, uh, anything with like your content, how that's performing on your website, just your whole overall digital marketing presence. Um, I work with clients, uh, to kind of improve that. So I've been doing that for about six years now. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's kind of like you, like, it, it helps one, you know, to learn the business and whatnot, but then you start to apply it to yourself and then start to branch out and have, you know, businesses and different things that you're, you know, dabbling in or whatnot. Because like my dad always taught me from a young age, like you want to have multiple sources of income. You want to be able to have multiple ways of bringing in money so that if one, you know, say I get hurt tomorrow, like, well, then that's my basketball income. Am I going to be at home, like broke, trying to find a job, trying to find what's next? No, like, cause I have established myself in multiple facets. So. Right. And shit, I might, we might need your help. We're trying to find my girl to get something to do while she's working from home. Right now, she's just going to pretty much work for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, that's the one beauty. Like, of course, I went to school for marketing and whatnot. And then I got really blessed. Um, After my first year pro, uh, I got linked up with a, a marketing agency out of Atlanta um, and kind of, like, built my, you know, career up through them, built my, like, level of expertise and whatnot. But it's really, like, a trial by and there's so many different like platforms out there and resources out there to kind of like you know help groom you because everything is moving to digital now everything so you know that i mean it's definitely a good industry to be in i'm happy you said it because i've been doing digital marketing when when i first came out my homeboy realized that i was making rapper mixtapes uh (laughs) graphics for it it's like yo you know photoshop and illustrator i'm like yeah he's like Bro, we got to start making money off affiliate links. And I was like, yeah. bro, so we started doing affiliate links. We started marketing uh, personal brands as far as creating their websites, creating their logos. And I'm like, yo, I was making more money overseas than like, I've never really made under six figures overseas, but sometime I was making more money doing digital marketing than yeah. I was you know, playing basketball. Because it's and- such a need. It's it's where the world is going, and it's yeah. easy. It's easy. It's not easy money. It took me ten years to learn all of those things. Yeah, but it's like you have nothing to do. These guys, like most, a lot of players that come overseas, they practice for two hours a day, and then and the rest of your day is free. 
I'm not like, joking. Yep. Do you know all the things you can do? You just work three, four hours per day on something else. Yep. You, you can create an emergency fund. You can create some investments to index funds on stocks. And when I tell them about index funds on stocks and real estate, like passively investment, you don't get big returns, but consistently doing it, they're like, man, I want Bitcoin. I'm like, bro, <laughs> it's 60K already, bro. It's like, you yeah, missed the yeah. way. <laughs> yep. Everyone want to get rich tomorrow. I'm trying to tell you. Take time. Yeah, like take advantage of the time. That's what I like about you. It's like, look like you do ads with companies. It's like Blake Griffin, like he's not popular anymore, but he's still signed to Jordan. Mm -hmm. While he's also have a, like they have, they're making money from the teams, but they're making money from, Barbecue grills. Uh, yep. Sponsorships and partnerships. Yeah. I try to, like, I'm happy that you said that because it's not just men can do this. Women can do this. Absolutely. Uh, and you don't have to be in the Euro League. You don't have to be, like, it's just, you have to have that networking. Uh, yep. And you, you got to find that. your niche. Like, what makes you different from the other people that are around you, you know? And what, what are you passionate about, too? Because you can find, I mean, there are so many like influencers now that are like, oh yeah, I quit my job and I, I'm a digital nomad now. And I like, you know, created a course on how you can, you know, uh, become an influencer on Instagram or how you can, you know, live in another country and develop content for them, you know, different things like that. Like there's so many different avenues you can take. Um, and like you said, we have nothing but time. Like if you don't have another job outside of, you know, playing basketball, you have nothing but time to like start to look at, you know, other facets of what you're passionate about. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm so happy you said that. <laughs> and like what a lot of athletes don't understand too. And what, like I've had to break it down for a number of them is that like you yourself as an entity are a brand. And so it's like, it's about like selling, you know, what you can do and, and who you are connected to and whatnot to other brands that you are passionate about. Like a brand I just linked up with, they're, um, they're cold compression therapy. Every athlete that has ever gone through, whether you've gone through major injuries or not, if you're trying to play long-term, you need things like that in your life. And I was like, hey, you know, like, I love your products. I love what you're doing. Like, this is what I do. This is who I am. These are the type of things I've been involved in. Like, let's see if we can work something out. Let's see if we can collaborate. Like, you got to find, you know, where, you know, companies that you're passionate about and then figure out how to sell yourself as a brand to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they underestimate the branding side of them because they're comparing themselves to LeBron. <laughs> yeah. They're comparing themselves to Candace Parker. And like you said, whenever you pass and like, I just, we got married uh, two days ago and I didn't have to pay for the photos. It's oh, because that's awesome. they see me, I'm passionate about photography. So whenever I see the cameraman around the cities, I'm talking about the lenses. I'm talking about the Lightroom edits. I'm talking about uh, exposure and compositions. And they're like, I'm a part of like a community of photographers. Exactly. Like, you know? exactly. Once again, that's my passions that led me to that. And then you get favors and I'm bringing value to them. They're bringing value to me. Making exactly. yourself valuable as a more than an athlete is is one of the key things that I think I like what you're doing. I went on your website and I seen how you were presenting yourself. I'm like, oh, someone want to invest in you just by the way that you present yourself. I'm like, if you on a net, I know a bunch of girls that play overseas. They look, they're talking about OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Oh, yeah, and I'm gosh. like, the way you present yourself, that. that's cool in America. And that's really cool in a certain culture in America. But I gotta handle business later. Like it's not gonna get you shut up. They'll yeah. lust over you and then they'll treat you that way, but they're not gonna take you serious as an entity. Exactly. Same with guys. I'm like, you got your middle fingers up in the pictures and you and your stories, you drunk. I'm like, your pants are sagging. Nothing like you can do that. I'm not telling you change who you are, but don't complain when you can't get these opportunities because people want you to represent their products exactly and that goes for you know jobs overseas too like because lo and behold they check all of that stuff like they check your social media presence they check this because they're about to invest in you and bring you to their team now granted you could be you know like if we're talking about you know diana tarasi maya Moore, all that okay yeah like you have a little bit more leeway but yeah, at the same time like when you are coming across as like yeah i'm about to in 
like invest in you and you're going to bring your mentality to my team, is it going to disrupt and become a cancer to everybody around you? Or are you going to help uplift them? So that's when it becomes more than just being an athlete that can put the ball in the hoop. It's like, how are you going to affect everybody else around you, you know? And like a lot of uh, European countries, I know it's more so for the women's side, but like we're, you know, we volunteer for like their kids programs and help with like coaching the youth and, and just like volunteering our time to do clinics and different things like that. So it's like, I don't want somebody who is, you know, drunk, like out and about in the city or whatnot, when you're wearing the team's logos and stuff, right. like you don't want that. And then to come back and, you know, I've had so many times where like, uh, I've heard stories of, yeah, you know, I was out and like somebody saw me and then my coach gave me a call the next day. And I was just like, Okay. Yeah. All that uh, sacrifice. Probably right. not the look you want to give because everybody talks. Their coach is going to talk to that agent. That agent is going to talk to, you know, the next team that they're like, oh yeah, we're fielding, you know, these offers or whatnot. And like looking at these athletes, like everybody talks and the basketball community, it's big, but it's also small. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a big, I, I think guys underestimate the reputation you leave behind with your teammates because the teammates talk, the, the players talk, the local players talk amongst each other. What Absolutely. kind of guys? He's a good guy. He's a cool guy. The local, the coaches talk amongst each other. The fans talk amongst each other. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, I signed two or three deals just based off my YouTube. Like I signed in Japan on Facebook, like a, <laughs> a six figure salary on Facebook. Yeah, I've never seen them. I just look at the team. I was like, okay, Kyoto is a big city. They're kind of in top three, one of the top three teams. I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> and, but that was your. I'm telling you, your social media, the way your digital real estate is the new resume. Absolutely, you absolutely. Yeah, be, you can. I can show you. You can show the film of you scoring thirty and forty. But if they see anti-Semitic, they see racist uh, tweets. They say you degrading women or they see you uh, f bombs, B bombs on all of your jokes, bro. They're not taking you unless you Shane Larkin or unless you like <laughs> them. Yeah. They're not taking you. Exactly. They don't need you. They got hundreds of others every day that's inquiring. <laughs> yep. You're literally just another number on the list. And so it's like that goes back to like making yourself more valuable than just a basketball player, too. Like if you want to, you know, like right now I'm getting to the point in my career where I'm like looking for something more long term. You know, you've been in France for seven years. I'm like, OK, I want to like be kind of at a home base. So it's like, what else can I offer a team besides? Yeah, I can play because at the end of the day, like they're going to be willing to do more for you if you do for them. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, she's made herself valuable. She's involved in this and this and this and helps this and is doing this. So it's like we got to keep her around. Like right. we, we absolutely we want to keep her around you know she's good with everybody everybody you know enjoys being around her and, and she helps out in so many different facets and she produces on the court so it's like we'd be stupid not to keep her so man well christina that's a breath of fresh air i'm happy that you were able to share that because whenever it comes from me i'm real direct i'm a little bit they call it harsh i'm <laughs> yeah. just real direct i don't I don't want to leave. My guy's the same way. And then I follow up like, okay, he really means this and he needs you to do this and this. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm used to that. <laughs> I'm so happy uh, for you to be able to share, you know, some of your time with me. Um, I got a game tonight. You got work yeah, to do. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. So, um, I wish you nothing but the best on the rest of your journey and, you know, keep in contact, hit me up for anything or anytime you have a question, you ever want to just kick it, just let Pop me it up. Know. Yeah, you absolutely. No, uh, appreciate it again. Thank you again. Uh, can you tell everybody how to follow you with the whatever you got going on? Plug yourself in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we are so my Instagram and like Facebook and stuff, it's King of Queens underscore zero eight. Um, and then working on, you know, a podcast with a friend of mine just tackling, like you said, you know, the um the experiences and journey from like men's and women's side and what that's like, you know, for your basketball uh, career and just like on and off the court. Um, it's called international grind podcast.com. Go visit it. And yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Uh, be safe. Watch that COVID. Stay healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Stay healthy. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, man. Thank you. All right.